The, the snow we had yesterday morning kind of lended itself to this, and I had the opportunity to take some pictures. So, what's in this picture? Snow. Yes, yeah, snow. So, white snow. Pretty clean looking, isn't it? Nice and clean and crisp. It's pretty, isn't it? Okay. Plus this. Are you sure? Brown snow. Brown snow. It's not white. It's kind of reddish, brownish. Are you sure it's snow? Yeah. So, that's kind of like the world we're in right now. When God created everything we see, it was perfect. Like that white snow. Clean, pure, no sin. Everything was perfect. And then came sin. And the world we're living in right now is kind of like this nasty, mushy, brown, ugly snow. So, at some point, we're going to go back to the white, beautiful, perfect picture. So, you guys have studied, I know both of you have, how water works, how the water comes down in either rain or snow and then goes into the ground, eventually it does what? How does it go back up? Evaporates. Evaporates. And then at some point, what is this nasty, brown, ugly snow is going to come back again as beautiful, white snow, right? in theory. Okay? Could be right. But it's going to come back. Alright? And, and that's how it's going to work with the world. Jesus is going to come back. There's going to be an end to sin and to all this nastiness and yuckiness and, 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 and ugliness that we have now. And everything is going to be perfect again. God is going to make everything new. He says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth which is pretty cool. And, and we just got done with Easter. We're still kind of celebrating that. And what Jesus did, and what he did, also cleanses us, right? Did you know that he says he makes our sins as white as snow? It says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Colors wool. White. Okay, so that's something we have to look forward to, right? If we have received Jesus Christ, if he's our Savior, our sins have been made clean again, right? We have been made clean in God's eyes, okay? And someday this world is going to be made clean and perfect and pure. Make sense? Okay. All right, let's have a prayer. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for what your word tells us, for the truth of your word that, that one day, Lord, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and those who believe in you, who are made clean again, Lord, will join you there. What a time that will be, Lord. What a place. What a beautiful place that will be. How exciting it is. We thank you for that today, Lord. We thank you for the illustrations you give us in the world around us, Lord. All we have to do is open our eyes and look. We thank you for this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. All right, well, this morning in our word, we are getting into John chapter 20 this morning. And we're going to read the whole chapter because we're going to go work our way through this today. We are in the NIV this morning, and we're starting with the heading, The Empty Tomb, starting in John chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. 
He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as a cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was, lot, was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciples, who had reached the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still hadn't understood from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple went back to where they were staying. Now Mary, outside the tomb, was crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Aramaic Rabon, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked in fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The next heading says, Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now let's come before the Lord. And pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the truth of your word. Father, for the example set forth in your word of how you show yourself to us, how you revealed yourself to the apostles, Lord, how you made it known that you were indeed risen from the dead, that you had conquered death, that you had conquered sin. Father, we praise you for that very thing this morning. And I thank you, Lord, for each one who has come to put their faith in you. And I pray, Lord, for those who will soon come to know you. We praise you for this today. Help me to speak clearly and boldly for you this morning. Help the hearts listening to be softened this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> First question this morning, how long was the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ? Do you know, Noah? 
the earthly ministry. About three years. It's not a lot of time, is it? Not a lot of time for a movement to start, a revolution to take place, one that continued for over 2,000 years, that's, that's still going. A movement, a revolution. Some would say, some use the word religion. To tell the truth, I really, really don't like any of those terms. Why? Because they all describe something temporary or something fake. A movement or a revolution that they're popular for a while. Then they run their course. They kind of die off. People get tired of, of whatever the cause was and, and they move on to something else. A religion. To use this to describe those who, who truly follow Jesus Christ is to lump them into a category with every other idol, coveting, self-worshipping, works-oriented religion that's out there. The God of the universe deserves better than that. I wish I could say I had the perfect term to describe what it is to follow Christ. But it's hard to put a name to something like that. I, don't, I do know that we are part of a body of believers of which Jesus Christ is the head. I do know that the church is referred to as the bride of Christ for which he will return and be united with. <clears throat> In the early years of the church, believers were referred to as Christians. In the Greek, this word means little Christs. And this was evident through those who chose to live as Christ, who strive to imitate his life to the best of their abilities. But we hopefully know that to follow Christ is to do more than imitate, but also to believe in who Jesus is, in what he has said, in what he has done, and in what he is yet to do, what the scriptures say is yet to come. Perhaps this is the best term we have. But at, that same, but at the same time, it is one that, that we have dirtied in our culture, the word Christian. For there are many who are professing to be Christians who are not following Jesus Christ at all and certainly have not, no relationship with him. So, so it's, it's a word that, that rings different with different people. Now today I want to focus on the believing aspect of being a Christian. How Christ reveals himself to us, just as he revealed himself to the followers shortly after his resurrection. I also want to touch on the urgency that there is to believe in Jesus Christ, as our window is growing shorter and shorter. Now the first interaction that Jesus has after the resurrection with his followers is with Mary Magdalene. In his revealing himself to her, we see his gentle nature and his love for her in his words and in his actions. Mary is distraught. She thinks they've taken him. She thinks he's gone. And she loved Jesus. She had followed him from the moment she believed. The moment she was healed. Though we're not, we don't know for certain, many assume that, that Mary is the very one that that wet Jesus' feet with her tears, that, that wiped his feet and poured perfume on him. We do know that from out of her, he cast seven demons. And out of her gratitude for what he had done, she followed and served him all the way to the end. Jesus knew this. He knew, his, he knew her heart. He loved Mary. He knew her distress, so he doesn't chastise her for not recalling what he has said that he would rise again. No, he simply says, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Now, he doesn't say woman as we would think of it today. This is, this is a softer term. Thinking he's the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. She doesn't recognize him, which is common. We're going to see with, with many who... who see Jesus shortly after the resurrection, they don't realize it's him. Whether it's him hiding that or them not believing. It could be as simple as with Mary. She's weeping. She is distraught. She's upset. Some of you know you've cried hard enough that you can't see anything going on 
in front of me. But she says, just tell me where he is, I'll go get him. And Jesus just gently says to her, Mary. And suddenly she knows. She knows that it is him when he says her name. She turned toward him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. You can, if, if you close your eyes, you can just picture the joy on her face as she leaps to him, so happy that he is risen. But he says, don't, don't hold on to me yet, for I have not ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. <clears throat> Some of you this morning can relate to Mary. You may have found yourself in a dark place, a sad place in your life, perhaps buried deep in sin with seemingly no way out. Perhaps not necessarily deep in sin, maybe, maybe just so depressed, so sad, maybe just at the end of your rope because it feels like the weight of the world is on you. Maybe some of you feel that way right now. And in that quiet moment, it may be in a moment of weeping, you felt the hand of Jesus upon you when you heard his voice say your name, just as he said, Mary. At that moment, you knew. You knew without a doubt that you were not alone. At that moment, you knew that he is who he says he is. I have heard testimonies to this very effect. And the people who have shared them have indeed followed him every day since that encounter with Jesus Christ, just as Mary did all the days of her life. It is knowing that he is right beside them that gives them the strength to carry on, to keep going when things are hard, to praise him in the good and in the bad. It is getting to that lowest point in our life that, that allowed them to feel his presence for that first time. I know there are those listening who feel like Mary, who either have or are pouring out their hearts to him right now, leaving their tears on the feet of Jesus. If that is you, know today that he is there. He is listening. Listen for that voice. Feel his hand upon you as he calls you by name. Now there are Marys out there. And then there are those like the disciples. Like John, for instance, and the others. We know, we know Peter, in fact, that he had proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah a while back in scriptures when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you, you are the Messiah. We know Peter loved Jesus. We know he believed. We didn't say he was perfect, as none of us are. But he loved Jesus, and he believed. John tells us when it really struck him. If we look between verses 3 and 10, in the account of them coming to the tomb, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen, lying there, but did not go in. So John's still standing outside, and, and Peter comes along, and he, he bursts right in. And they, he saw the strips lying there. And then John gets up the courage. Finally, he says, the other disciple, he refers to himself in an odd way, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Though they still did not understand the scripture. He saw and he believed. He says, and then they went back to where they were staying. So, and then Jesus reveals himself to the disciples shortly after as they are hiding in, in this home behind locked doors, undoubtedly trying to sort out everything that has just gone on. In verse, verses 18 to 20, Mary Magdalene's telling them what he saw. She's come to the disciples saying, I, I've seen the Lord. And she told them the things he had said to her. So Mary had told them what she had seen, Peter and John have been to the empty tomb and seen the proof of the resurrection right before their eyes and surely had told the others as they're all gathered there. 
Starting in verse 19, on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Jesus comes to them and they're so excited that, that he has overcome death. There's no questioning, no, no, well, maybe this is a trick. They had believed when they had heard what they had, what the others had seen. And now this is validated as Jesus stands before them and says, here I am. Again, we see the gentleness of Jesus. He comes to them and says, here I am, see for yourself. Some of you are in this boat rather than, than in the situation where it was. You've been around for a long time, just as the disciples had. But at some point in your journey, there was a defining moment. For John, it was seeing the, the clothes lying where the body should have been. That was the moment it all came together for him, the moment the Lord revealed the truth to him completely. For Peter, it was back when the Lord said to him, Who do you say that I am? The Holy Spirit had revealed it to him. Just as the Holy Spirit allowed John's heart to be in the right place. And when he saw those cloths lying there on the stone, he believed. It all made sense. It came together. Again, I have heard testimonies of people who say, all of a sudden it just clicked. Something in their life, some event, some word spoken to them, maybe a song, something happened. And all of a sudden, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, they could clearly see that Jesus is the Son of God. That he is our Savior, that, that we need to surrender and follow him. For some of you, that, that, that moment is coming. It might be today, it might be tomorrow. You have been around Christian, the Christian faith for a while. You have heard the word of God and, and read for yourself. But you're still on the fence. There hasn't been that defining moment. At some point, you have to decide if you're all in. What is it going to take for that aha moment to take place? What else has to happen? Or better yet, what do we need to let go of? What doubts are in our mind? What, what vices or idols are standing in the way of us saying as Peter did, Jesus, you are the Messiah. There's only going to be so many chances. And that number is getting smaller. Now, Jesus wasn't done. He came to the disciples again because, you know, he missed one. One wasn't there. He knew that one still didn't believe. Here enters Thomas. We don't see his name a lot in the scriptures. Most of you probably would know him better if I called him Doubting Thomas. Many who, who know very little of the scriptures have heard the term Doubting Thomas. Verse 24. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came again and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out and put, put your fingers in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's Thomas. He needs concrete proof. He's a hard nut to crack. The others are telling him, we've seen the Lord. There's no doubt that he heard all the testimonies of Mary and, and Peter and John and, and their excitement. That You wouldn't be able to, to deny that kind of excitement. And yet he says, unless I see the nail marks, unless I stick my fingers in his hands and in his side, I won't believe. Not until I see it for myself. And Jesus, knowing this, came to them again behind locked doors and said, peace be with you. He stood among them and his attention turned to Thomas. 
He says, here's your proof. Here I am. Stop doubting and believe. I have to believe he's not as gentle as he was with the others in this fact, in this moment. Thomas says to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Just like there are many who find themselves in the categories you mentioned before, there are even more, many more, who are in the same mindset today as Thomas. You can say, but pastor, I've been going to church for years. Our parents took us to Sunday school, and we just haven't seen enough proof yet. We haven't seen that one defining sign from God that says, here I am. You can say that. So could Thomas, a disciple of Christ, one of the chosen, one who Jesus had called. He'd been there for it all. He had seen everything the others had seen. He'd heard what they heard. He'd seen every teaching of Jesus, the miracles. And yet here he was. Refusing to believe, needing more proof. But here he was, doubting, refusing to believe them. Some of you were once in that boat, the one that Thomas is in. Some of you are there right now. For those of you who are there, the Holy Spirit at some point softened your heart. Just as he's trying right now for many to soften your heart. To get you to believe at some point for many of you to hit home. As it did with Thomas, finally, when Jesus stood before him and said, stop doubting and believe. Look at me, here I am. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. It finally hit him. Some of you are still waiting for that moment. You're waiting for that one defining sign from God. You're saying, I, then I'll believe. When he gives me the, what I'm looking for, I'll believe. Then I'll leave all else behind me and follow him. I, I just haven't seen it yet. I have a couple questions for that individual. What does God owe you? What, is, what makes any of us that important that he should come and set himself down in front of us and say, here I am, can you see me now? He owes that to no man. Not a single one of his creation, yet, yet he gives us plenty of proof anyways. He has placed you in a body that in itself is a masterpiece. One that science cannot fully explain or replicate. He has surrounded you with a universe that runs in such a perfectly timed harmony that if it were a millisecond or a fraction of a degree off, we'd all be dead. Not to mention, he has given you a copy of his very word preserved for you over thousands of years. And in it, you will find history, families, facts, prophecies that have come true, hundreds of prophecies. You cannot deny or explain all of these things except for to give credit to the Almighty God. There's no man-made explanation for any of this. Even today as we speak, we are living in a time that the very words of Scripture are leaping off the page in front of us. The events that point to the return of the Savior, the, His return to come and take us home are unfolding as we speak. And I, I don't mean just the the pandemic that's going on, there's plenty going on in the world that points to Jesus Christ coming back. There is many signs going that should lead us to the indication, to the reality that Jesus Christ is real, that he is who he said he is, and that there is an almighty God. See, that's the decision we have to make. Whichever category you feel yourself in right now, wherever you're at, whoever, whichever situation you can relate with today, 
You have to decide one thing. Do you believe not only that there is a God, many believe there is a God, a God of some sort that will most certainly, and, and somehow we're going to end up on the warmer side of eternity. Many believe that. What we must decide if we believe today is this. Did God really come to earth and take the form of a man in Jesus Christ and die on a cross for our sins as an innocent man, a sinless man? Did he then raise from the dead and ascend to the right hand of the Father until the appointed time to return? Our whole faith rests on this very thing. You can't get away from it. You can't stop at Jesus Christ. You can't just say, well, I'm good with God. But I'm not sure about the whole Jesus thing. The whole raising from the dead thing. You can't do it. If you do, you've got to throw it all out. The scriptures, since the beginning, have told of the Messiah. They have told how, where he would be born. From what family. They have told of his betrayal. Even down to the number of coins it would take to buy Judas. They told exactly what would happen. And they tell exactly what's coming next. And very soon. It's time to make a decision. To get off the fence and either follow Jesus or walk away. He, God has no use for lukewarmness. You've heard saying you've got to do you know what or get off the pot. Time's wasted. So why is this my message today? For one, it's because it's the only message that matters. There are many who will give you a lot of different things, who will only tell you about how much God loves you and how much He will bless you and how great it is to follow Jesus, and they're all good things. But if that's all we ever hear, we're, we're only getting the fluffy version. We're not getting down to the truth of what you really have to believe. When that's all we hear, we don't get that hard question of, do you believe Jesus is exactly who he said he is? Do you believe without a doubt that he rose from the dead? That our sins are covered because he did that? Matthew chapter 7. Two verses there. Verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not all but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. I share the message I share because I don't want the Lord to say to any of you when the day comes, away from me, for I never knew you. And I know that none of you want that for yourselves or for your families. I can't bear the thought of, of giving you the fluff of Scripture and leave you never knowing what it is to believe in Jesus Christ. I teach this message for another reason. Each and every day of late over the last year, I, I felt this increased sense of urgency and a greater sense of duty to proclaim the gospel of Christ even to those who claim to know it. For there is no more powerful message out there than that, than what Jesus taught and what Jesus did. Now I had something happen recently in the last week or so that twice that has upped my level of urgency. The first, as I sat beside the, the bed of a dear friend who was soon to be with the Lord, in a room surrounded by loved ones, I sat there. I heard the ticking of a clock. Soon I heard the sound of many clocks. Occasionally one would chime, and then another, not together, but yet ominous in their own way. It was not a long period of time, it was, and I was not alone, but it seemed like an eternity. And as if I was the only person in the room hearing these clocks, the deafening tick of those clocks, all, all I could think about was the brevity of life and the length of eternity and the importance of knowing where we will spend that eternity.
And again, Saturday morning, yesterday, I sat at my desk in the morning before anyone was up. I was reading the scriptures and praying. And on my desk sits a clock, given to us by another dear friend. And as with any clock, it makes noise, just like, as long as it's not digital. And I've never, but I've never really noticed the sound of this clock. But yesterday morning, as I sat praying, all I could hear was that clock. And it, it grew louder, and then it, then it began to be in sync with every other clock in the downstairs of the house. And I checked, there's three other working clocks. And I know they don't all say at the same time, because we have that argument often. But they all clicked together. It, it became a deafening roar. It was as if the Lord was saying, time is short, Tim. Tell everyone you can. Tell everyone. So friends, I'm telling you today, and I'll tell you again, time is short, and decisions must be made. Time is short. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. With that, let's close in a word of prayer today. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, Father, we have known for years that time is getting shorter. Father, you have been trying to reveal yourself to us. You have extended that call. You have extended that hand, Lord, saying, come to me. Soon that hand will retract, Lord. So, Father, I pray for each one who is listening today that before it's too late, that they would extend their hand, that they would, they would accept that call, that they would surrender to you and say, okay, I get it. You are who you say you are. That they would seek that forgiveness that you offer, that new life that you offer, and that they would be born again in you, and that they would secure that spot that is reserved for them in the new heaven and the new earth. Father, we thank you for that today. We praise you for today. We praise you for your goodness, for your love, and for your forgiveness. We thank you today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.